Tonight I want to talk to you about the finished work of the cross. And uh, I'll be using the NASB version of the Bible, just in case you want to check on what I've said. So hanging on the cross, Jesus said, it is finished. And many people don't realize the full import of those words. The Greek word he used is, and I'm not Greek, so I'll just give it my best shot, T-telestii, and that means paid in full. It also means completed, and it means the will has been fully implemented, like the will and testament. It's actually been fully implemented. And, you know, one of the things that I often think of, that Jesus didn't trust anybody to implement his will. He became his own executor. He rose from the dead and became the executor of his own will uh, to make sure that we, his people, get our full share of the deal. And is that good news? Yes. You can bet sure it is. Um, Jesus reconciled to us uh, on the cross. He reconciled us to God by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, the hostility or the anger that was created through the law. The law of commandments contained in ordinances. The reason that people became angry about the law was because they couldn't keep the law. No matter how hard they tried, they would inevitably break one or more of the laws. And, you know, as Paul the Apostle tells us very clearly, you only got to fall short in one part and you blind the whole deal. So Jesus had to come and do something better and create a better covenant with better promises. And it might reconcile them both, the old covenant people and the new covenant people. He wanted to reconcile all people to himself in one body to God through the cross. By it, having put to death the enmity. And Jesus nailed the law. He nailed sin. He, nailed him. he was nailed to the cross. And in being nailed to the cross, the law was finished. It was nailed to the cross, finished. And in Hebrews it says in 8.13, when he said, when God said, a new covenant he has made the first obsolete. Now, just to add a little bit of emphasis here, when it talks about being made obsolete, we need to understand the difference between obsolete and superseded. Because a lot of Christians think the old current covenant has just been superseded. It's not obsolete. Obsolete means completely wiped out. It's of no more value. Whereas superseded, if there's a new model car comes out and uh, you're fortunate enough to um, not be too worried about what year it was made in, uh, you can buy that superseded model. It's probably better than the new one anyway because it's had all the, all the little uh, squeaks and t uh, tweaks knocked out of it and they've perfected it by that time and and so uh, we need to understand that the law was not superseded it was made obsolete but whatever is becoming obsolete is growing old and is ready to disappear in other words to be done away with uh, law keeping or grace we need to understand that many of the things that we take into our mind are actually, actually old covenant. And we need to get free from those things so that we can live in the new covenant. And so I'm just going to give a presentation here of a contrast of law keeping and grace. The old covenant concepts against the new covenant ones. Some of these old covenant concepts have crept into our understanding. And so as a result, we are putting ourselves back under the law and under conditional Christianity rather than enjoying freedom in Christ. Man under the law. In Romans chapter 7, 7 through 21, Paul the Apostle describes what it was like under the law. And uh, many of you know and you've heard people preach about this. The things that I didn't want to do, I find myself doing. And the things that I want to do, I can't do because um, I, I'm still under the law is really what, it, what he was saying. And the Apostle Paul, uh, we know that he was talking to, to people under the law because at the top of the chapter, 
he actually addresses them to you who are, know the law. And so then he proceeds to describe what it was like under the law. Um, frustration. And then man under grace in Romans chapter 8. Of course, we love Romans chapter 8 because it begins with, there's no, Therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. And he begins to contrast the experience of being in the new covenant rather than under the old covenant. Paul describes his life under the new covenant, grace, the new creation life in Christ. So what's our mindset? Is it an old covenant mindset? Do you believe God's people are still under the old covenant laws? Or do you have a new covenant mindset? Or do you believe God's people are under new covenant grace? Is it good news that Old Covenant thinking says, Jesus dealt with my sins at the cross, but we're still sinners waiting for his return to set us free from sin. I like to point out here that when Jesus comes back again, he's not coming back and going to be doing something that is going to deal with our sin. And how I know that is because the scriptures tell us that when he went to the cross, he dealt with sin, full stop. Past, present and future. All sin was dealt with at the cross. And so when it says that Jesus is standing at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for us, he isn't up there saying, Oh God, they've done it again. He's not doing that. What he is doing, he is declaring what he achieved at the cross on our behalf. He's given us everything that pertains to life and godliness, as it says in Peter's epistle. New Covenant thinking says, Jesus dealt with all of our sins at the cross, once and for all, Colossians 1.22. Is it good news that Old Covenant thinking says, I've got Adam's fallen nature tripping me up from time to time, which the Bible says in Romans chapter 5, verse 14, um, death reigned from Adam even to Christ uh, or to Moses. New Covenant thinking says, My sin nature died when Jesus died. And that's we find that I'm crucified with Christ. Romans, sorry, Galatians 2.20. I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. We have new creation life. From the moment we were born again, we became new creations. We had a sinless life. God gave me his own divine nature in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4. We are partakers of the divine nature. You have God's nature in you. And God's nature doesn't sin. Um, people say, well, why do I sin then? Well, because you don't know that you've been set free from sin, for starters. And you don't realize that you have the ability in Christ and through the power of the Holy Spirit to resist the enemy and see him flee from you, enabling us to live free from sin, as it says in Romans 5, 17 and 21. Romans 6, 6, somebody said, Romans 6, 6, Romans is the sixth book of the New Testament, and it's the answer to the sin question, um, 6, 6, 6, and knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with. When it says our body, it's not talking about this human flesh. It's talking about who we are, our soul and our spirit. And that part of us has been totally renewed. And as we know, the scripture tells us that we have a treasure in an earthen vessel. This earthen vessel is, is going old and so forth, but um, inside us is the treasure of Christ in you, the hope of glory. And we need to realize that it's as we emphasize and as we focus on who lives in us and the fact that the life that we're living is his life and that we have the Holy Spirit enabling us to do what we can't do in our human, human strength, in our humanity, so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. We're not slaves to sin anymore. We've been liberated from that and we have become new creations. We are slaves to righteousness. So what's your understanding? Old covenant thinking? We still have the old, uh, have to keep the old covenant laws which lead to death and condemna condemnation. 
Well, no. Praise God, we don't. Uh, under the new covenant, we live our life secure in the knowledge of the new covenant grace and abundant life. And God has called us to walk in, in the power of the Spirit, in the power of an endless life that he has given us. In old covenant thinking says God's people are sinners, continually needing to make fresh sacrifices or doing penance to be accepted. So many people, not only from uh, the Roman church, but in the Protestant churches feel when they do something, they make a mistake and everything goes, uh, what do they say, topsy-turvy, and uh, that they have to do penance somehow, you know, they, they can't accept that they could immediately say, thank you, Lord, you've forgiven me, and that they can walk on in Christ, knowing that they have victory over their mistakes. Um, but uh, under the new covenant, God's people are justified. They're made holy, saints and righteous, um, sanctified, perfected, complete in Christ, renewing our minds and all things made possible through his sacrifice on the cross. It is finished. He's not going to add anything when he comes back. Yes, we will get a new body, and we're looking forward to that, most of us who have grown a little older, um, are looking forward to that new body. Um, but apart from that, everything that we uh, need is already ours, as it says in Second Peter, that he has given us all things, that pertain to life and godliness. Old Covenant thinking says God's people hunger and thirst for him. Now you'll notice that this is a New Testament scripture, but it's an Old Covenant scripture because when did Jesus institute the New Covenant? When he died or when he was born? When he died and rose again. So this was before he, he uh, died. Those that hunger and thirst after righteousness shall be filled. So it's an old covenant concept. It's conditional. A new covenant says God's people are completely satisfied by him. Do you remember the story of the woman at the well? And Jesus says to her, uh, If you come to me and I will give you a drink, I'll give you a well of living water, as Liz explained um, in that other message, that uh, we have a, a well springing up within us when we are born again and Jesus said you'll never thirst again if you have that well inside of you you'll never thirst for God anymore because you'll be completely satisfied and there's a bunch of scriptures there Colossians 2.10 1 Timothy 6.6 6, and Hebrews 13.5 Old Covenant thinking says the Holy Spirit convicts believers of their sin notice it was before the cross before the new covenant was instituted and so um, the New Covenant says the Holy Spirit persuades believers of their righteousness in Christ. You see, under the Old Covenant, um, they, when they sinned, they had to make a sacrifice uh, to atone for their sin, to cover it. That word atone means covering. Uh, but under the New Covenant, God uh, removes our sins as far as the east is from the west, and he persuades <coughs> believers the Holy Spirit persuades us of our righteousness. So the Holy Spirit is continually wanting us to realize that we are righteous in Christ. Not on our own basis of righteousness, but on the basis of imputed righteousness. He has imparted and imputed righteousness to us so that we might live his life the way he intended it to be lived. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, He who knew no sin became sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ. And so we're righteous. And for us to say we're righteous, we're not saying that we're without mistakes, that we don't offend anybody, but we are saying that in God's eyes, we stand indisputably accepted and righteous. And that's what's important for us. The Old Covenant says God's people are slaves to sin. Romans 6.6 6 says that we are under the Old Covenant, before we came to Christ, we were slaves to sin. We were captured and uh, we were under the thraldom of the enemy, slaves to sin. But under the New Covenant, God's people are slaves to righteousness. And that's a wonderful uh, thing that's happened through the cross. 
God's kindness leads us to repentance. People say, but what if I sin? Well, God's kindness immediately <coughs> says, well, you know, you are righteous and contrasts what we've done with what we are. And, uh, you know, some people say, well, if I sin, I must be a sinner. No, if you've been born again, you're a righteous person who occasionally m messes up. And uh, the more we grow in Christ, hopefully the less we mess up. Old covenant thinking says God destroys sinners because of their sin. Do you remember the uh, tower where the planes flew into that tower and people said, you know, those people must have been particularly sinful. Well, Jesus said something similar about a tower in the Bible, the Tower of Siloam. He said, were those people upon whom the Tower of Siloam fell, were those 21, I think it was, people more sinful than the rest of us? Or the rest of you. <laughs> he wasn't in it. Um, but uh, obviously the answer was no, they weren't. They just happened to be in the wrong place when the tower fell over. And uh, on the other hand, New Covenant thinking God destroys sin in the body of Jesus so that sinners can be saved and become saints. You know, we're, sometimes we get people to turn to somebody and say, I'm, hello, I'm Saint, I'm St. Robert, um, and uh, whatever your name might be. And people are really embarrassed to do that, but really we shouldn't be embarrassed because Saints doesn't mean, you know, that you're totally uh, there yet and you walk around with a little, you know, neon light around your head. Uh, but the fact of the matter is it means the called out ones, the ones who have been called out by God, called out of the world into his kingdom. The Old Covenant says God's people continually need to ask him for forgiveness, whereas the New Covenant, God's people are already forgiven and thank him for his forgiveness. Romans 6, 1 through 11 talks about being already forgiven in Colossians 3, 13 also. And uh, there's a passage here from uh, the Gospels. You won't find the Gospels in the Gospels. That's hard to understand, but the Gospels are a, a misnomer. They're letters uh, that record the story of Jesus before the cross primarily. And there's a little few verses towards the end of the Gospels which are post the cross um, up until then. So when Jesus taught his disciples to pray, he was teaching them as a law teacher. Jesus was a law teacher who occasionally alluded to what it was going to be like when he brought in the new covenant. And if he hadn't have been a law teacher, they would have torn him to shreds. The priests and the Levites and so forth would have torn him to shreds because he was teaching something that was contrary to the law. But he taught the law. So when he taught the disciples to pray, he taught, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Now, think about it. From a New Covenant perspective, there's something wrong with that passage. And the thing is, it's conditional. It's a conditional prayer. The New Covenant is an unconditional covenant. It's not con based on conditions of us fulfilling something. The law could not bring us to salvation. The law was there to bring us to Christ who gave us salvation. And under the New Covenant... Um, Forgive us, forgive each other, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. So it's unconditional. We forgive each other because we've been forgiven. It's, one, it's great to be able to be generous because you know that you, you've had that same generosity shown to you. Um, the Old Covenant thinking says God removes his presence from people when they sin. That's Old Covenant and we need to have a New Covenant understanding which says God said he'd never leave us or forsake us. Are we going to believe a contradiction or are we going to accept that one was old covenant and this is the new covenant? Um, he said, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Nothing can separate us from his love. And so we know of a surety that God has brought in the new covenant to enable us to live in his presence and to know that he'll never leave us or forsake us. doesn't matter what we feel like. It's what the word of God says. 
Under the old covenant law, the law focuses on self-sacrifice and human effort, us doing whatever we can to appease God. But under the new covenant, God sends grace through Jesus Christ and that focuses on, on the sacrifice of Jesus and his finished work. Old covenant thinking says God's people do his work to gain his favour. Deuteronomy 11, 29. But under the new covenant, God's people work for him because they have already received his favour. We have his favour. We are subjects. It tells us in one version, because the amplified version, we're subjects of his grace, mercy and favour. And we need to know that because when you know that you have favour, you you can, as it says in uh, Hebrews, that we can boldly approach the throne of grace. We can boldly approach God and ask for him to work on our behalf. We're destined to love and serve him. That was He destined us. That's why we serve him. It's our destiny. And we do it because we enjoy pleasing him. Okay, Old Covenant thinking says God's people are constantly crying out for more of God. That's um, an oxymoron, an impossibility, because uh, you can't have any more of God. You've got all thing, all of God, all the fullness of God dwells in you, and uh, you can't have any more of Him. You can understand Him more, and that's what we're we're really endeavouring to do to understand Him more and more every day. Under the new covenant, God's people already have everything they will ever need. Second Peter one three all things, um, God the Holy Spirit in all His fullness lives within the believer. In actual fact, um, if you study the Scriptures, you'll find that not only the Holy Spirit lives in us, but Jesus do- does, and the Father does also. The omnipresence of God is with us, and lives in us, and we need to um, be um, cognizant of that, so that we live our lives out of the power that dwells within us. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Um, Old covenant thinking, God's people pray for revival. Under the new covenant, God's people live in revival and spread revival wherever they go. You see, the reason, as some person put it, the reason revival tarries is not because anything to do with God. It's to do with us. When we realise that uh, as the scripture says in Mark 16, these signs shall follow them that believe, then we will we'll be using our rear view mirror to check to see whether they are and going out and letting it happen, making it happen in the name of Jesus. Old covenant thinking says God performs signs and wonders and miracles randomly when he feels like it. Sovereign acts. You'll hear people say, well, that was a sovereign act of God. God stepped in there and acted sovereignly. Well, under the new covenant, Christians perform signs and wonders and miracles under the direction and through the power of the Holy Spirit who dwells within them. And we need to know this so that we're not waiting for some move of the Spirit of God to come along and to change us and to change um, the circumstances in which we live, we already have everything that we need. We have it already. It's ours. It's not something that's going to come on some move of the Spirit of God. It's ours now. And the, the moves of the Spirit of God are generally, uh, gen, generally, <laughs> um, they are generally um, brought into reality through people who believe what I'm telling you tonight. So under the old covenant, God's people think God is in a bad mood. Or under the new covenant, God's people know he's in a great mood. He's giving abundant life, granting great promises, bestowing free gifts. And God is, uh, every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights in whom there is no shadow or variableness. He doesn't bless one at the expense of somebody else. If you see he's given something to somebody else and you'd like a little bit of that, go for it because it's there. It's available to us in Christ. It's easy to spot an old covenant, uh, sorry, a new covenant teaching. What we need to ask is, 
Does it point to what I need to do? Or does it point to what Jesus has already done for me? Does it make me look inwardly? You know, examining. People come to the table of the Lord and they say, let a man examine himself and so let him eat. Otherwise he's drink, eating and drinking damnation to himself. Well, the reason he's eating and drinking damnation to himself is because he's living under condemnation. He's living without the revelation of the new creation and who he is in Christ and the new covenant. Because under the new covenant, uh, all of that was dealt with at the cross and we have come into a new relationship, a life-giving relationship with Jesus Christ. Or does it shift my focus to Jesus? If the preaching is shifting your focus to what Jesus has done for you, then it's a new covenant teaching. A new covenant teaching will always point me to Jesus. So go and enjoy living the finished work of the cross. Thank you. Thank you.